Well, this seems a bit strange, doesn't it? To be an online church. There's similar things I've done in the past. I used to, for about 10 years, work at a church north of Detroit. And there were times, because I was away a lot more then than I am now, where they said they'd like for me to still be the preacher uh, that Sunday. And so we would record it, and they'd show it up on the big screens. This is a bit different. We're, we're living in very interesting times, unprecedented times. We made this decision to go online for a reason, and that reason is because we love you. We love you too much to put you under pressure, and I'll explain that. We are a very multi-generational church. It's one of the things I love about our church is that we literally have babies and 90 plus year olds on the same pew, loving each other in each other's homes. We're very multi-generational. Now, those of you that are of a certain age and up feel a compulsion to be here. I remember that we were told by the preachers, when the doors swing open, you swing in. And if we were to hold worship here, you'd be here because that's just who you are. You feel that obligation before the Lord, and God bless you. you you've been the rock, the bedrock, and the, the, the spine, whatever metaphor you want to use, of the church for generations, people just like you. But if some of our young people have come into contact with somebody who's come into contact with somebody, we don't want to endanger you. We love you. And we don't want our little ones to, uh, to walk around wondering, did I cause a problem? You see, whenever a contagion hits, it can either go like this, and you have mass deaths real quick, or you can flatten that curve, and after a while, the virus goes away because it doesn't like the change in temperature. Uh, this particular one doesn't like anything over 77, 78 degrees. Whenever things change, it goes away, and we didn't lose that big burst of people, as you've seen in China and Italy. So this really is wise. There is music for this week. We're going to have music. We plan to have music, lessons, communion devos. We encourage you to go get some grape juice, some matzah or regular bread. It's not the emblems themselves that are important. It's what you are thinking of and doing with them that is important. So be prepared. Uh, the governor has asked us not to meet because we're too big of a church. Uh, if this goes on for another couple of weeks, we will do better and better each week. Fair enough? I certainly hope so. We don't want to also uh, discourage any of you and thinking, oh, Satan is, is, is running us through fear. No, he isn't. He isn't at all. So Christians have always had to break up and not meet where they planned because of natural disasters, because of government interference, uh, because of whatever, they've had to meet here, there, uh, elsewhere. And that's what we do. Our prayers unite us, our love unite us. And Fourth Avenue will once again be Fourth Avenue on the other end of this. Do not let Satan say, if you were just more faithful, you wouldn't be so afraid. You know something? The devil likes to use fear. God does not. He says his perfect love cast out fear. So if you're fearing, uh, feeling fearful and feeling you're not being faithful enough to God, that's not God's voice. That comes from the enemy. You just be at peace. God's grace has you covered. Absolutely, he promised it with the life, the blood, and the resurrection of his own son. So that pretty much counts for that. We, we have a brain. God gave us brains. And therefore, we've got to use those as well as our lips for praise, as well as uh, our hands for service. We have to use our brains. And we're trying to use our brains. Pray for your shepherds and pray for your staff because we're still working. We're still out there among the people, the best we can be, when we're allowed to be and doing what we can. And that's another thing you might want to do. If you are able and you're not in the real target bubble, of I'd say 60 and up, and I'm in that bubble. If you're not in the 60 and up bubble, check on your neighbors who are. Check on your neighbors who you haven't seen for a while. Check on your neighbors that have illnesses like diabetes, cancer, those are uh, asthma and the like. And remember, right now is when Bradford pears and dogwood and cherry blossoms and all the allergens are hitting and you live in Tennessee. People are going to get this. They're going to be afraid they've got the virus. Check on them. 
make sure they're okay. Go get the groceries for them. Go get their necessities for them. They, they can still pay for them, but go get them and bring them back so that they're not exposed. Let that be a Fourth Avenue neighborhood ministry, no matter where you live. We've set that up in our subdivision, and it's grown to take in the next subdivision as well. And we're getting to see who in our neighborhood are excited to serve others. It's, it's actually what the devil might mean for ill, God is taking for good. Now, before we get into the lesson today, and we will be doing the lesson, we want to say our heartfelt sympathy to the Lovett family. Uh, Sherry Lovett, Lovett lost her, her mother, Helen Overstreet, died while under hospice care. They're going to hold a private burial service. Um, this is always a hard thing, no matter how old your mother is. And so our love goes to the Lovett family. They're a very important part of our church. And on a happier note, one of my favorite people in the world is our sister Christine Pig, and she turns 97 on March the 17th. And March the 17th, come on, St. Patrick. So our happiest of birthdays to Christine. Stay home, stay well, and let us serve you. Shall I feel you hush the enemy underneath my feet? You are my sword and shield, though troubles linger still. Who shall I feel? I know who goes before me, I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. My strength is in your name, for you alone can save. is a victory who shall I fear who shall I fear I know who goes before me I know who stands behind the God of angel armies is always by my side the one who reigns forever a friend of mine, the God of angel armies is always by my side, and nothing formed against me shall stand. You hold the whole world in your hands, I'm holding on to your promises. You are faithful. I know who stands behind The God of angel armies Is always by my side The one who reigns forever He is a friend of mine The God of angel armies Is always by my side I know who goes before me I know who stands behind The God of Always by my side, the one who reigns forever. He is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The God of angel armies is always by my side. Oh. Song 
still going to talk about Ecclesiastes and if, if the teacher in Ecclesiastes has not upset you yet he's going to now because this chapter is pretty hard and it doesn't matter whether you're Democrat Republican in the middle or you don't know what you are he will hit you in this chapter because of our natural tendency is to look away from God and to look to human groups to be our God and make everything right in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, starting at verse 8. In fact, we'll just read verse 8 for the now. If you see the poor oppressed in a district, and justice and rights denied, do not be surprised at such things. For one official is eyed by a higher one, and over them both are others higher than them. The increase from the land is taken by all, the king himself profits from all the fields. Justice for those who have been denied justice should be a big issue for us. It should matter to us. In our highly politicized world, even saying you care about justice makes people think, oh, they're part of that group or they're part of that group. They listen to this politician, they listen to that politician, and that's very, very sad, frankly. I wish that it was not. In the Old Testament, there wasn't a whole bunch of let's run to the government to fix things because their government was fragmented. It was um, not effective. And in the New Testament, you see very little reliance on government to do anything right because, once again, it is not of God. It is here. It's a necessity. You've got to have gov government. I, I don't think there's any room in our Christian theology for an anarchism, a, a no law, no government attitude. God did establish government as a way for us to, to at least have some modicum of justice. And in fact, we do see some reliance upon government and some of our responsibility toward government. John the Baptist there were soldiers who heard him and wanted to follow him and were unsure, what do we do? We're soldiers. We're, we are either part of Rome or part of Herod's group. There, we're Romans, uh, we're, rather we're soldiers working for the government. And John the Baptist said, don't leave, do your job, but do it fairly. Be content with what you make. In other words, don't rob people, don't be unjust, but do it well, do your job well. He didn't tell them, get out of the government, all government's bad. Paul gives us a little bit more there in that when Paul was um, receiving injustice, he appealed to Caesar using his rights as a citizen. 
And another time, whenever he found that there were bound to pe uh, a band of people that had sworn to come after him and kill him, he, had, he, he used his rights. He went to the governor and demanded an armed escort from the government to keep him safe from a group of religious people. That shows it's all right. If Paul did it, and he did it more than once, we also have Jesus picking out a tax collector. We, we see him eating with tax collectors. We see him uh, telling us we are to pay our taxes. So we're not anti-government at all. So what are we saying? The teacher is very pessimistic about government. The government will do a lot of things very, very well for us, but it will not do all things well, and therefore we cannot make it our God because government brings power Power brings riches, and all of those things corrupt. As the old expression is, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Very true. And it was true then. This is not new in our society. And, and if you take a look at Matthew chapter 25, and we're going to do that, and you're used to seeing slides in the back, but you're going to need to have your Bibles out, and you need to know where these things are. Anyway, Matthew 25 is one of my favorite passages because it shows us what's going to happen at the end of all days and that's something of great interest to me and I bet it is to you as well. He says here Jesus is addressing the people who are saved on that great day of judgment. You will live to see this either in your body or out of your body so this is pretty important. We are going to be in the group he is addressing and in Matthew 25 and in verse 34 we're, we're jumping in the, in the middle the king will say to those on his right, that's us, come you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For, this is why, because I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me seems way too simple, doesn't it? In our very modern, protected, and coddled world, we have a hard time understanding the import of just feeding, clothing, and the like. You know, the, we have a lot of folk in our church that are involved with Franktown Open Hearts, with um, Hard Bargain, with Habitat for Humanity, with One Gen Away, we, um, and of course with Grace Works, which is a huge work here. We, yes, all of those things are good, but I, I need you to go back in time, into their time. It is way too simple for us to feed and to clothe, to set up these neighborhood things like I was, I was talking about. And, and then we think, well, that makes us good with God. Yeah, it does. And back in this time, the way they did it, and by, by necessity, shows us what God is requiring of us in our day. And it might be more than that which we have been doing. Food was not abundant, not in that day. I mean, food's everywhere now. There are people that are you know, running after shops and overbuying things, and that's, that's understandable. We wish it didn't happen, but people are gonna do that. But we can still get food. There, there are restaurants everywhere, there's food everywhere. We've got stuff in the pantry we've forgotten about, and there's always the mystery Tupperware in the fridge, right? But back then, food was not always abundant, nor was it around when you really needed it. And sometimes your kids would be crying for food, and you just had to tell them, there is none today. Maybe we'll find some tomorrow. And that was not just the poor people. That was a lot of most people. All of the unrich lived a reality of, we don't have food just because we want food. And we almost never get the food we want when we want it. That was not their world. That was not their universe. It was not possible to do this. You, you saved your food, you gathered it, and then someone comes along and you find they have none. What if you barely had enough to ease your own hunger pains for the day and you find this person? Jesus said, you were the kind of people who still opened it up and shared. Instead of saying, you know, our God, please feed that person, you were the person who fed the person. That's really important because we as Christians tend to have the, we're humans, and we tend to uh, call upon government to do this for us or God to do it for us when God says, you're there. 
and you've got enough. We might say, but I've only got enough for me. Well, the widow said that to the prophet, didn't she? And the prophet said, to the measure of your faith, it'll come right back to you. Take these, these uh, pots and go fill them with oil and I'll show you what God can do. And God did a miracle for her, but he only filled the receptacle she took out. He filled no more. In other words, your faith can be limiting what God can be doing. And if you're asking God to do it through another agency so that you are left unhurt, unharmed, and you don't have to do without, that's a problem. It's a real problem. And it's the same, by the way, if you um, with clothes. Clothes were very few, hard to make. We've talked about this before. The old song, Scarborough Fair, Can She Make Me a Shirt? You know, then she's a bargain. Uh, there was the old song, Johnny Boy, I believe it was called, in, in America. Uh, in, in early American years, had a line, can she bake a cherry pie? Oh, Billy Boy, that was it, Billy Boy. In none of these songs is the woman's looks ever referred to. It is, can she help us get food and maybe a bit of clothes? Can she make something so that we can, we can have clothes? Clothes were rare, hard to get. Do you remember that when the apostles were fishing after Jesus' resurrection, they didn't have their clothes on? and to, uh, to swim back to shore, to come back to shore to see Jesus, they put their clothes on. And the same, when you'd go in the house at the end of the day, you'd basically have a, a very small undergarment, but you'd hang up your clothes in your house because that was it. That was your clothes. You've heard the expression, they'll give you the shirt off their back. Now you know what it means. Now today though, we could give somebody the shirt off our back because we got more shirts back home. That was not the case. So here God was saying, the people I love are the people when they see somebody without a shirt. Don't say, well, the government should be fixing that. I pay taxes. Or, what a shame, I bet they're not hard workers. Or any of this. Instead, they take what they have, even if it's the only thing they have, and they share it with the one who does not. They don't make a judgment. They make a move. And they share it's, it's, it's stunning when you realize it that way. And, when, and visiting prison, when you went to prison back then, you did not have food and clothing. You did not have medicine unless your family or somebody brought it to you. So they, Jesus is saying, you go take care of even those people. No judgment. Your judgment is only they're hungry, therefore they must be fed. They're naked, therefore they must be clothed. That's it. They're lonely, they must be visited. That's the only judgment we're allowed to make. And remember going to see people in prison back in this day and in many places today puts you on a watch list because the government is saying what kind of person would come to see that person. You were risking your life as well as giving up the few things you had to share them with others. It, it's stunning when you realize this. So Matthew 25 is not simple at all. And what God has called us to do is not simple at all. God asks us to respond to injustice by sharing what we have with those who have been treated unfairly by the world for whatever reason. We join them. We're not afraid to be tarred with the same brush, and that expression has a horrific history. We're not afraid to be associated with them, just like Jesus was not afraid to eat with prostitutes, tax collectors, sinners of all kinds. We also have to get ourselves dirty and have to put ourselves at risk. He did not call us to take our burden and vote for people that will say they'll take care of it and think, well, well, I've done my job then. I voted for that to be handled. No. No matter who's in and no matter whether they're handling it or not, we have a job to do. If we see the person, if we have contact with the individual, we are responsible for our behavior. In the very same way that if I saw a woman sitting on a sidewalk sobbing and close all a shovel, I don't say, well, you know, the police should have been here and fixed something like this. Or I don't know what's going on, but I don't know where the family... No, you don't walk by this person. You stop. You do... You now, again, we have a brain. If it's at night and you think it's a trap, make a call. Get a group to go stop. But at the same time, don't be so quick as to shove this responsibility to another entity or another individual, or another group. Evil will show up. 
I'm not surprised by the arrival of um, COVID-19. I'm not surprised by evil of all sorts, whether in a natural world or through the actions of evil men. It happens. We're not shocked. We're not thrown backwards. We're not terrified. We go, new reality, we'll deal with it. The best way to prepare for the appearance of evil is by expecting it to happen. Get ready and you take care of it. Now here's where the teacher is going to offend everybody in the room. Seriously, what I'm about to talk about is going to make you think if you're on one side of the political divide that I'm on the other and I will get equal hate mail and equal calls. That's how I know I'm doing my job right. right? When, you're, when you're not on either side, both sides shoot at you. And um, yeah, that happens. So I need you to listen. I need you to listen through the Holy Spirit to what the teacher has to say. And again, going back to Ecclesiastes, you would have thought that I would have marked that, wouldn't you? Ecclesiastes, there we are, chapter 5 again, starting at verse 10. Whoever loves money never has enough. We could talk about that for the next 10 years, but we're not going to. Hang on, keep going. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owners except to feast their eyes on them? The sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether they eat little or much. But as for the rich, their abundance permits them no sleep. Wow. Think about this for a while. Allow me to offend you. All right? No matter where you are on the political divide, hang on, because I'm going to offend everybody. Just remember that President Obama told us that sometime in your life you've made enough money. And I, you know, the people on the right just rah, at that. And I, and I was going, you know, absolutely true. But we never know where that is, do we? We're really poor at drawing that line. And he disappointed many when after he left the presidency, he bought a $15 million mansion right by the sea that we were told was going to rise and take over all that land. And we could sit here and wag the fingers. But before you do, have you ever seen the inside of any home our current president has designed, decorated, and lived in. Oh my goodness. Why do we need gold-plated taps in the faucets? Why do we need... It, it, there's Beauty becomes gaudy really fast. No politician is free of this. And sadly, Christian, no person is. None of us. We have stuff in our home that were just was not necessary. It doesn't do anything. Some people say, well, I like to look at it. Cool. <laughs> really, I'm not against that at all. But we need, before we start throwing rocks at our, our President Obama or President Trump, we need to pull back a little bit and say, humans have the tendency that the more money we get, the more things we put quotes around this need. We do. And it doesn't matter. In fact, we've done this experiment several, several times. You can find it on your own. Ask any income group, how much more money do you need before you would consider yourself good? Maybe not well off, but comfortable. The average is 20%. Whether they're making $8,000 a year or $8 million a year, the average is about 20% more than they're getting now. The teacher was right. We all, all of us, not just presidents, grab for more than we need. And then we don't sleep well because we need more and we're afraid of the stuff that we've got going away, being stolen. Stuff is okay. I don't begrudge either of those presidents a dollar of their money. Somebody will talk about, you know, Tiger Woods has made too much money back in the day when he was still at the very top. And I would look at him and say, we don't have very many golfers who can do what he does. So why do you care what he makes? It's, it's his money. Exactly. But what are we doing with our money? Often we don't think about that because we're judging what other people do with their money. I'm here to tell you, I have wasted a lot of money. I have bought the wrong things. I have invested in the wrong things. Not like stock market, I have no clue about that. I mean, by, by buying, for example, um, guitars that did not make me a star, golf clubs that were clearly defective. We could go on, correct? We are all guilty 
of Ecclesiastes 5. So he's saying, do not look for those above you to come in and save you because they make as big a mess as you do. Sometimes bigger because they got more stuff to make the mess with as we would if we were there. There's a problem when you want stuff and you need more stuff. And how many of us have not said, I'm running out of room to store my stuff? In Spring Hill, where I live, uh, just a bit south of Franklin, there is a huge boom in the growth of these massive storage facilities. As you come into Spring Hill, you are greeted by, I don't know, three or four story one, but before you go another mile or mile and a half, there's a brand new one that's at least four stories on the other side of the road. They're building, what is, what is all this for? People now have to pay other people to store their stuff. They have so much stuff. Stuff isn't going to help us because we don't get to keep it. Ecclesiastes again, chapter 5, verse 13 and forward. I have seen a grievous evil under the sun, wealth hoarded to the harm of its owners. I don't know about you, but I just got an arrow soundly fired into me. I'll say it again. Wealth hoarded to the harm of its owners. Mm. Or wealth lost through some misfortune. So that when they have children, there's nothing left for them to inherit. Everyone comes naked from their mother's womb. And as everyone comes, so they depart. They take nothing from their toil that they can carry in their hands. It's a very important qualification that they can carry in their hands. We'll get back to that. This too is a grievous evil. As everyone comes, so they depart. And what do they gain since their toil for the wind? All their days they eat in darkness with great frustration, affliction, and anger. Very pessimistic that. The rich aren't as happy as you think they are. And by the way, I'm a very aware of, of the absurdity of calling other people rich. We can compare our lifestyles here in the U.S. to the lifestyles around the world, and we are aware we are the rich people. But let's for now play the game that we're the normal people, and we're talking about the people with the mansions on the hill and the corporate jets and all that sort of thing. All right, let's just play that game. If you look at the rates of suicide and drug addiction, even sexually transmitted diseases, it's as high in the super rich as it is in the super low, and both of them have a higher rate than all of us in the middle. Why? Well, these people have a, and th that are poor have a brutal life. It's just brutal. They got nothing. They're looking for anything to ease their pain. The rich people have all the stuff, and it didn't fix the pain, because there's no God. There's, there's no God. So, I talked about that we take in our hands. We enter the world naked. When we leave it, we can take nothing that we have in our hands. But you do take things with you. I will take my love of 4th Avenue when I go see Jesus. Many of you whose faces are flicking through my, my memory banks right now, I'm going to take my love of you. My relationship with you will not end. My love of my wife will not end. When Jesus was talking about there's no marrying or giving in marriage in heaven, people have turned that into such weirdness. Cammie's still going to be my angel up there. Not a real angel. She'll be Cammie. And I'll still be her um, acceptable husband up there. We won't be married because we're, we're not physical beings. But all that love's going with us. All the love I've left behind to my grandkids. I hope that goes with us. And I hope when I go, there will be people going around that will be telling stories of Jesus that I told them. And maybe even telling them better. I, I certainly hope so. You get the, the drift? You take your relationships. You take your love. You take, you take with you all the good that you are also leaving behind. And none of it involves stuff. So, that said, got to wrap it up here. The last few verses, chapter 5. This is what I've observed to be good. That it's appropriate for a person to eat, to drink, and to find satisfaction in their toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life God has given them, for this is their lot. In other words, don't feel guilty you have things. Enjoy things. That remember, when we meet people who need, we share. We do not wait for another to share it for us. We share. 
Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot, and to be happy in their toil, this is a gift of God. They seldom reflect on the days of their life because God keeps them occupied with gladness of heart. Remember that song back, and don't worry, I'm not going to leave it. Back in the day, count your many blessings, name them one by one. And, and Bible class teachers would often talk to us about, you, know, you should write down your blessings. I'm 63 years old and I want to tell you right now, I've never tried because I know I couldn't write them all down before I died. I've been blessed. Now, can I write about the pain, the brokenness, the hurts that I've received in my life? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. But which one of those, thinking about which one of those is going to get me through the day happier? You have a choice what you're going to think about. Hatred for another doesn't make sense because it's like drinking poison waiting for them to die. No, you're the one poisoning yourself. Let's just move on. Let's find a way to love. And especially in a time of darkness when people are grabbing toilet paper off the shelves for reasons that are... Um, and, and they're grabbing things and they're thinking, you know something, why don't you be the one that shares with the neighbors rather than hordes? Even if it means you end up doing without. Even if it means you hurt yourself. No, don't be silly, don't be stupid, but whatever their lot is, you're going to enter in and share that lot. Guess what? That's the one thing Jesus says impresses him. Matthew 25. That's the one thing he says he's looking for in the people that bear his name. So, I have some work to do. I have some things to get rid of. I have some attitudes to change. And I have some blessings to think about. And I bet you do too. God bless you. We hope you stay well. If you need us, you get in touch with your staff and your shepherds. We are here. We will help with everything we've got, even in these times, because we are family. We are the Fourth Avenue family. But more than that, we're Christians.